Good morning, and welcome to today's program titled Advances in Prostate Cancer Screening and Management, presented by Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine at Ohm Live. You are tuned into the first live session, Beyond the PSA, Emerging Biomarkers for Prostate Cancer Screening, with Dr. Bill Catalona. My name is Dr. Tony Schaefer. I'm the chairman of the Department of Urology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and co-chair of this educational program. Today's sessions are live and are meant to be interactive. We will be taking your questions in real time throughout this presentation. I encourage you to send us your questions anytime by typing them into the box located on the lower left-hand side of your screen. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Bill Catalona, professor in urology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. In addition, Dr. Catalone is the Director of Clinical Prostate Cancer Program of Northwestern's Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Catalone developed the PSA and is internationally known for his work in prostate cancer detection, screening, and management. Welcome, Bill. I'd now like to hand the program over to you. Thank you, Tony. Um, this program is really based on a conference that was held about a month ago uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, the NCI SPORE and Society of Urologic Oncology Workshop on Biomarkers of Prostate Cancer Aggressiveness. And in this conference, each biomarker was discussed by a presenter and by a critical discussant and then reviewed by a panel. And I've tried to summarize um, the results of, uh, of this conference. So, Bill, another confounding factor, as you mentioned, was inflammation infection. If you had a patient who you suspect or think maybe inflammation infection is contributing to the PSA, and I assume then the first two tests and maybe even part of the third test, uh, might the, the other two tests help you in that regard because they're not, are, are they susceptible to uh, inflammatory impact? It's said that they are not. Okay. And, uh, and I think that there's pretty good evidence that they're at least not as much, and okay. so, and, and they can be used in that setting. So that could help us get out of mind. Another thoughtful question uh, we have received is, uh, could these tests in any way influence your decision as to how to treat? I, you know, radiation versus continued uh, active surveillance versus uh, or, uh, uh, surgery, for example. Do you see that playing a role at all? I don't. Uh, it, it, uh, I, I think it would, could play a role in terms of determining whether to use active surveillance or active treatment, uh, because if they had aggressive disease, then you would be more likely to use active treatment. But it's not like a breast cancer test uh, where you say, this patient will respond to chemotherapy and okay. this one won't. You, these don't tell you whether the tumor is going to respond to radiation versus surgery, for example.
first question that deals with hormonal therapy. And so this is an audience response question and um, just want to gauge the audience knowledge base on some of the hormonal therapy agents before we move on to castrate resistant disease. So one of the hormonal agents that we use is a drug called Degarelix. And uh, so here's the question, A, is this drug an LHRH agonist? Is this agent like Aberelix a pure LHRH antagonist? Is this agent causing a surge in serum T for up to 28 days after initial administration? Or does this drug, uh, should this drug be used along with bicalutamide? So which is the correct answer? We're getting some responses, um, and they're a little bit split, actually. We've got about, I don't know if we'll cut to this. Um, the majority are, are answering B, so this agent, like Eberelix, is a pure LHRH antagonist, but a few answered A, that it's an LHRH agonist, and a few uh, answered that it causes a surge in serum T. No one answered D. Good. Well, the correct, we'll go ahead and give the correct answer. The correct answer is B. It is a pure LHRH antagonist. And uh, the reason we wanted to show that testing question is because this particular gentleman was initiated on Degarelix. Um, he was started on it, the standard 240 milligram dose subcutaneously in the first month, followed by 80 milligrams subcutaneously in subsequent months and the first month then his PSA dropped to about 25. And the reason we used Degarelix in this case was he had fairly advanced metastatic disease and we really did not want him to have any type of disease flare. So this was the reason for the Degarelix. Before we talk about Aberadon, let's test the audience knowledge base. Which of the following is not a side effect of Aberadon? A, hypertension, B, hypokalemia, C, Addison's disease, D, hypernatremia. Which one is not a side effect of abiraterone? Mind. Okay, so um, the predominant answer is Addison's disease, uh, second hypertension, then kind of split between hypokalemia and hypernatremia. Um, and I think the, the key teaching point here, Judd will show a slide in mm. a second, but abiraterone is a CYP17 lyase inhibitor. So if you remember way back to medical school, the uh, kind of the adrenal hormonal pathways, it blocks in a certain portion of that, and that's what leads to these side effects, um, which are consistent with mineralocorticoid excess. So those are things like hypertension, hypokalemia, um, patients can also have edemia, edema and things like that. And so we actually have to give uh, corticosteroids such as prednisone with that to kind of rescue patients from the mineralic corticoid excess syndrome. So the correct answer is actually D. Yes. Uh, D is the correct answer. So uh, all A, B, and C are at least possible.
Thank you very much, Dr. Mathai, for that wonderful talk. We have a few questions from the audience and that we'd like to, that the audience would like to pose. One is that I'm not, uh, I've not seen my cardiology colleagues employ a radial access technique. Is that relatively common? Uh, radial access, if you have a cath in France, uh, you have about a 90% chance of probably having radial access. I certainly do the vast majority of my cases radial. Uh, my recommendation is if you had a patient who needed a cath and you sent them to an interventional cardiologist who doesn't do radial caths, I would send them to a different interventional cardiologist. It really is something that in the United States should be done more often. It clearly reduces bleeding, and it also, especially in the STEMI population, reduces mortality. And so, so radial access, yes, is, is becoming a more common uh, procedure in, the, in the, the U.S. as it should. Welcome to moving toward a personalized approach to screening and management of colorectal cancer, presented by Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine at OMED Live. You are tuned into the first live session titled Screening for Colorectal Cancer, Occult Blood Testing, Flexible Sigmoidoscopy, Colonoscopy, or CT Colonography with Dr. Rosario Ferreira. My name is Dr. Al Benson, and I'm Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and the chair of this important CME program. Today's session is a live, interactive program that allows us to take questions in real time throughout the presentation. I encourage you to send us your questions anytime by typing them in the box located at the lower left-hand side of your screen. We've already received a number of questions, but I would encourage the audience to uh, please type in questions as you think of them. Uh, but why, why don't we start uh, with some of the questions we've received. Uh, the first is, uh, why would you even consider a test that looks at only part of an organ, 
meaning the flexible sigmoidoscopy. Why, why does that uh, persist as an option? Well, the reason, that's a very good question. And it's a question that has been asked many times a while ago. And in fact, at one point, it reminds me of a joke that someone made, like, oh, it's like doing mammogram on one breast only. The reality is that, looking back, that's not entirely correct. Number one, uh, you do, or there was a thought that we had more cancers presenting or occurring in the lower, in the, uh, the, the lower, the left side of the colon, so the lower half of the colon, if you want, than proximally. That's no longer the case. But importantly, this whole notion of a sentinel uh, lesion. So you might have a proximal cancer, but you would have polyps for the down. We know that doesn't hold perfectly true. But the reason why we still are considering it's very much is based on the evidence. As you look at the numbers for how flexible semoidoscopy has performed and how colonoscopy has performed, even though intuitively you would say colonoscopy is better, and I'm a gastroenterologist, I do colonoscopy, I hold it dear and near. However, I have to accept the fact that the evidence has not been excellent to say that, to support that. We have not made um, substantial improvements in colorectal cancer mortality reduction.